Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I'm coloring the Rabbit Hole Designs Hold My Flowers stamp set. I will be coloring these images with my Copic markers, so I am stamping them onto Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock, my favorite for Copic coloring, and I'm stamping them in Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink. When I have finished coloring, I will over stamp them, I'll put the images back into my Misty, and re stamp them with um, Versaclair Nocturne Black Ink so that I have a nice dark black outline. And then I will send them off camera through my brother's scan and cut to cut the images out. I did not purchase the coordinating dies with the stamp set. I do have some issues with my Copic markers. Some of them were dry. I had to find substitutes. One of them blooped all over my page. I don't know what it is about that RV13. It always bloops on my page. Don't know why. Anyways, once I finish coloring and get these um, pictures all cut out or the flowers all cut out, I'm going to create three note cards. I am not going to add sentiments because then I can use them for whatever I need to in the future. I think that's all about the coloring. So let's jump into our crime. Our journey today takes us to the state of Vermont. Now Vermont was initially settled early in the 18th century by both British and French settlers. And the conflicts between the two nations continued clear up until the French were defeated in the French and Indian War, after which the land that was Vermont was ceded to England. During the American Revolution, Vermont declared itself independent, separate from the original 13 colonies, but the Con Continental Congress refused to recognize that fact. Vermont was finally admitted to the Union as the 14th state in 1790, after 14 years as an independent republic. The capital of Vermont is Montpelier. It is the smallest of all the state capitals in the United States, and it is the only capital without a McDonald's. In 1968, Vermont banned billboards, and they were the first to abolish slavery in their constitution. So yay, Vermont. Vermont is one of the top producers of Olympic skiers and riders in the nation. Hello, the snow. Vermont is the leading producer of maple syrup and has nearly 1,000 dairy farms, the average farm having 130 cows. Vermont is the nation's number one brewery state per capita with more than 35 breweries. And I know I'm not saying that right, and I don't know why I can't say that today. The place that makes the beer. Okay, Vermont has the most per capita. Lake Champlain covers 435 square miles with 212 miles of Vermont shoreline and is home to Champ, the fabled lake monster. You know, Vermont's own version of, of the Loch Ness Monster. Vermont has 808 lakes and ponds with more than 7,000 miles of rivers and streams. Vermont is home to a 272 mile long hiking trail. Vermont is also home to the nation's first ski tow, and it is the headquarters of Burton Snowboard Company. There are more than 6,000 miles of snowmobile trails. There are more than 65 golf courses, and there are more than 100 covered bridges in the state of Vermont. Vermont is also home to an indictment based on apparition and thus the first proven wrongful conviction. To tell this story, I'm going to jump back and forth between two people for a little bit. So let's start with Russell Colvin. Russell was born about 1774 in the Republic of Vermont to his parents, Richard Colvin and Rosanna Russell. Now, at this time, Vermont is its own country and there's no marriage date listed for Richard and Rosanna. Like... Not that I could find on any family tree kind of paperwork, like nothing. I suppose that they were married because it's the mid-1770s and people just did not not get married then. 
And given that Vermont was going through this transition between independent nation and, um, you know, they were owned by two countries or settled by two countries and they were independent nation, then they were part of the United States. It is possible that the marriage was never recorded. However, um, she is listed as his mother, but they're not listed as married. He was the second of six children born to his parents, which is another reason I think they were married. He was one of three boys and had three sisters. And as you can imagine, because of the date of this story, records from his life, his early life are scarce. In fact, until he got married, there wasn't really much to report. So let's talk about Sarah Sally Bourne. Sally, as she was known, was born on the 12th of July in 1783 in Manchester, Vermont, now part of the United States colonies, at least according to the Continental Congress, and her parents are Barnett and Elizabeth Bourne. She was one of five children, three boys and two girls, and surprise, their night life was normally uneventful and therefore very little record of their life until her marriage. Um, you want to guess who she married? If you guessed Russell, you would be correct. Now, Russell married Sally. She went by Sally um, sometime around 1800 and were parents to eventually eight children, three boys and five girls. The one family record I could find was that Richard, Russell's father, had a habit of taking these little journeys without his family. Apparently, Richard always returned, but you know, he just would go take a day trip and come back a little while later. Then one day, Richard left on one of his little trips, but this time he packed up and moved to Rhode Island and never came back. And it appeared that Russell would inherit this trait from his father. From time to time, he would get up and walk away, leaving his family, sometimes for a day or two, sometimes for several months. But he would always return to his wife, Sally, and their children. Now, after Richard packed up and moved away, Russell was left in charge of his family farm and was responsible for providing for his mother. However, Russell was considered feeble-minded by the people of Manchester. They did not believe he was capable of running the family farm by himself. The town of Manchester had written into their town rules, operating procedures, whatever you want to call it, that the town had an obligation to protect the rights of widows. And they feared that Russell would run the farm into the ground, leaving his mother with nothing. So the city fathers confiscated the Colvin farm, and then they leased the ground out to tenants and used that rent to support Russell's mother. Now, Sally's father was called Barney, and he was the son of Nathaniel and Freelove Bourne, and they had been early settlers in the city of Manchester. At the time that Nathaniel and Freelove settled in Vermont, Vermont was famously famous for being wild and godless, and the Bournes, Nathaniel and Freelove, helped establish a Baptist church there. They were known for their righteousness and their godliness, and Nathaniel and Freelove did not, well, their offspring did not agree with that train of thought. Um, Barney's family especially, and especially two of his sons and his daughter Sally, um, lived the old Vermont lifestyle, the, the ungodly, heathenist, you know, wild um, lifestyle that Vermont was known for in the old days, right? Um, Sally and her brother Stephen and Jesse just, they fell back in those old patterns, now, it was reported that the born boys were wild and reckless. Stephen was described as malicious, passionate, and when he was angry, he was blind to the consequences. Jesse seemed to follow his older brother's lead, and Sally was tough, willful, and disrespectful. 
Stephen actually called her, quote, one of the devil's unaccountables. Sally had the same kind of wonderlust that her husband um, inherited or learned from his father, and she would just take off alone whenever the mood struck her and eventually return. Another thing about Sally, she was perpetually pregnant. Now, when Russell lost his Manchester farm or his father's farm to the city, the only option they had left was to move him and Sally to move their six children at the time to her parents' home. Now, unfortunately for Russell, his in-laws did not like him, like at all. They treated him with utter disdain. Jesse and Stephen resented that there were more mouths to feed, and they taunted Russell. And I imagine that he and his need to wander off were not much help on the farm. Russell responded to his in-laws taunting by continuing to take his little trips away from his family. And then one day, around 1912, Russell left and didn't come back. Talk about history repeating itself. Now, Sally was out of town the morning of May 10th, 1812, when Russell and their son, Lewis, were working in her father's fields with her brother, Stephen and Jesse. Now, according to Lewis, the son, Stephen and Russell began to argue, and Stephen was angrily sharing his feelings and resentment about having to share the farm's meager resources with Russell and Sally and their numerous children. Um, reportedly, the argument raged for hours and then it turned violent. Lewis claimed that his father hit Stephen with a stick the size of a writer's whip. You know, like that's going to hurt, but it's not a big stick, but it's going to hurt. Um, that prompted Stephen to pick up a piece of a tree limb and knock Russell to the ground. And supposedly or reportedly, when Russell tried to rise, Stephen knocked him down again. And this is when Lewis ran away in fear because he saw his father lie motionless on the ground. Now, what happened next is uncertain, but Russell disappeared. And it seemed like at first that he had simply wandered off again. He'd gotten his feelings hurt. He had had his um, pride wounded. So he just took off. But prior to now, he had never left without telling anybody. And, but this time he did, he just left. And also before now, he had never been gone longer than nine months, you know, the always pregnant wife. But this time, those days turned into weeks, into months, and into years. And eventually, a suspicion of foul play began to, you know, it, it, it went more from suspicion to rumor to, oh, maybe we should look into this. Now, Sally continued to wander around. And where were her children? I guess with her parents. I forgot to look into that. But I guess she just left her parents with her, or her children, rather, with her parents and her brothers and did her own wandering. And eventually, after one of her little wandering trips in 1815, she came home pregnant. Now, at the time, under Vermont law, an unwed mother could swear the child, aka name the father, and then he would be compelled to provide child support. But Sally could not name another father of this child because in the eyes of her law, her husband was still alive. So legally he was the child's father. And if this wasn't weird enough in 1819, seven years after Russell's disappearance, suspicions were then forced out into the open when Amos Bourne, Sally's uncle, revealed a dream he had in which he was visited by the ghost of Russell Colvin. According to Uncle Amos, the ghost stood by the side of his bed and told him that he had been murdered. It then led Amos to his graveside, an old cellar hole in a field that had once belonged to Barney Bourne, 
Sally's father. Of course, when this news came out, other Manchester residents were supposedly visited by Russell's ghost, and a court of inquiry was convened, and Jesse Bourne was arrested. Stephen had long since moved to New York, so he was temporarily spared an arrest. So this cellar, this hole-in-the-ground cellar, which was supposedly revealed to Uncle Amos, was dug up. And inside the cellar, they found a coat button and a jackknife, which were both identified by Sally as belonging to Russell. Other than this, there is very little evidence to justify holding Jesse, but Jesse was pressured to confess, and he wouldn't. He, he kept saying, nope, 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 didn't do this, he would not confess. But a neighbor, a man named Thomas Johnson, um, apparently witnessed the argument that occurred on the 10th of May, 1812, and he had a private conversation with Jesse. Jesse came out of that meeting ready to confess. He said he believed that his brother Stephen had killed Russell, and he, and he could tell them within a few rods, there's a quote there, here's my fingers, you can't see doing air quotes, where the body was buried. So, of course, the town member set off in a frantic search that resulted in the discovery of a few charred bone fragments and a toenail near an old tree stump. So, soon after the excavation of the cellar hole, a mysterious fire destroyed the sheep barn on the Bourne farm, and that led to rumors that the fire was somehow related to this crime, this, this um, alleged murder of Russell. Then, a few days after that, from beneath a stump nearby, a dog found, more, found bone fragments. And um, three area doctors said, oh yeah, these are human bones. These are human bones. 100% they're human bones. So it was now determined that a posse would be sent to uh, the town of Denmark, New York, for the purpose of returning Stephen to Manchester to be charged with murder as well. Meanwhile, in Manchester's jail, a plot was at foot and created to obtain more information from Jesse. While in jail, Jesse shared a cell with a forger named Silas Merrill. And Silas promptly began cooperating with authorities. Out of the goodness of his heart, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> Silas claimed that Jesse confessed to him after a visit from his father, Barney. According to Silas, Jesse told him that Stephen had clubbed Russell to the ground during an argument. Barney, the father, happened along and seeing that Russell was still alive, cut his throat with Stephen's penknife. Then, according to Silas, the three of them then buried Russell in an old cellar hole, but two or three years later inexplicably dug up the remains and buried them in the barn. And then after the fire destroyed the barn, they moved the bones, this time burying them near the tree stump, right where the dog found them. Okay. In all the world, jailhouse snitches are the most reliable sources of information ever. <gasps> Wrong. <laughs> Silas agreed to testify against the brothers in exchange for his immediate release. The state's attorney, a man named Calvin Sheldon, accepted the deal and Silas was set free. Now, by confessing or in confessing, Jesse was trying to save his own life by placing most of the blame on Stephen, who he believed was out of reach safe in New York. But when he learned that Stephen had been arrested, he recanted saying the confession had been false. The state's attorney completely ignored that retraction. And in fact, um, it strengthened his resolve, the attorney's resolve to seek the death penalty in this case. And suddenly, more witnesses were coming for, forward to swear that they had heard Stephen and Jesse threaten Russell's life seven years ago. They just remembered it just now. Oh, other witnesses belatedly recalled after Russell's disappearance that the Bournes had said things suggesting they knew he was dead. 
And attorney Sheldon felt he had a solid case against the Bourne brothers. Now, having been arrested and held in custody, Stephen also confessed, but he claimed that he acted in self-defense, and that claim was largely dismissed. Um, Stephen was reportedly a man of quite low intelligence and very little formal education. And the precise language and the emphasis on mitigating crime of the confession uh, made people believe that it was actually written by his attorney. So the defense attorneys, Richard Skinner and Leonard Sargent, were distinguished and learned, but like everybody else around, they assumed that Jesse and Stephen were guilty. So the Bourne brothers would be tried for murder. Before the trial began, the largest of the bones that the dogs had found was compared with an actual human leg bone that had been preserved after an amputation in a nearby county. The bones were so obviously dis dissimilar that the physicians who had previously been 100% certain, there goes my finger quotes again, that the ones found um, near the tree stump on the Bourne farm were human, yet they changed their mind because comparing them, obviously they're not even the same. These physicians now agree that the bones were animal. And by this time, the physician's earlier 100% guaranteed opinion had done its damage, right? If the bones had been declared um, inhuman, like from animals, Jesse and Stephen would not have been arrested, most likely. If Jesse and Stephen had not been in jail, well, Jesse especially, Silas would not have been able to implicate them in his, quote, you know, Jesse's, quote, confession to him. And the brothers would not have made such incriminating statements that they did recant. But all of these things together ultimately, inevitably sealed their fates. And the court's biggest problem in the trial of Stephen Jesse was finding a jury of 12 men who were not already convinced of the brothers' guilt. All right, we need to talk about this ghost. This community was so superstitious that they attributed Uncle Amos's account of his dreamy visits from Russell's ghost to divine intervention. They 100% believed that Russell was sent to Uncle Amos to bring the brothers to justice. That visit, that ghostly visit, was not actually used as evidence in the trial, but without Uncle Amos's dream or, quote, visit, the brothers would never have even been indicted because nobody was really looking for Russell. There were suspicions, but nobody was looking for him before Uncle Amos's confession. And let's talk about this jailhouse snitch. Silas and his false claim, from what I can tell, he never testified. He left town and duh, didn't stick around. You just got out of jail for free. You're going to stick around? Yeah, no. So the main body of evidence introduced at the trial by the state's attorney was an attempt to corroborate the confession testimony of the, quote, eyewitnesses, you know, finger, you know, finger quotes again, um, who claimed seven years later to have seen the Bourne brothers and Russell arguing on the day he disappeared. I mean, maybe they did, and maybe it was so regular that they didn't pay any attention to it. But why didn't they bring it up seven years ago? I don't even know. Sally also testified that when she told her brothers that she was pregnant and that she needed to name the father of her baby for support, Stephen said, according to Sally, that she could go ahead and, and quote, swear the child because Russell was dead and he knew it. It was also stated that Lewis, the son who witnessed the fight, asked his uncles what became of his father and he said that Jesse reportedly told him that they had put him where potatoes won't freeze, referring to a root cellar dug below the frost line for storing vegetables. Also, in the spring of 1815, some children found Russell's hat, and one of his sisters commented that Russell would never go anywhere without his hat. Which, I mean, that was kind of common at the time. Men wore hats all the time outside. So... Yeah, theoretically, he wouldn't go anywhere without a hat, but apparently he wouldn't go anywhere without this hat. So, 
Vermont law at the time required three members of the state Supreme Court to sit as a panel in any potential capital case. And the jury had no trouble reaching a guilty verdict, so the judges presiding over the case sentenced both brothers to death. The Vermont General Assembly convened a special session to consider a plea for clemency. Because Jesse appeared less culpable, his sentence was commuted to life in prison, but Stephen was denied relief. Stephen's execution was then scheduled to be held January 28, 1820. As the date of his execution approached, um, Stephen suggested to his attorneys that an advertisement be placed in the newspapers asking for information on the whereabouts of Russell Colvin because Stephen was sure he was still alive. His attorneys thought it was futile, but they placed the ad for him. On November 26, 1819, there was an article that appeared in the New York Evening Post describing the Russell Colvin murder. The article marveled at how the divine intervention of Uncle Amos's dream had revealed that, that he had been killed and who the killers were. And the next day, this article was being discussed by a group of men in a New York City hotel, including a man named James Wepley, who used to live in Manchester, Vermont, and another man named Tabor Chadwick, who was a Methodist preacher from Shrewsbury, New Jersey. Now, James personally knew all of the people involved in the story of Russell Colvin's death. So he kind of like he, he felt the story was like a hometown thing, right? He, he related to the story and he thought about all the things he had heard that day in the hotel. And he remembered something that Tabor, the man from New Jersey, had said. Tabor remembered that he knew a man, a farmhand on a Dover, New Jersey, who, on a farm in Dover, New Jersey, by the name of Russell Colvin, who often spoke about Vermont. So Tabor sent a letter to the New York Evening Post claiming that he believed Russell Colvin was still alive. James Webley read the letter and went to Dover to see for himself. The farmhand was, quote, partially deranged and went by another name. He denied being Russell Colvin, but his responses to question about Manchester, Vermont, convinced James that he was, in fact, Russell. So time being of the essence, because Stephen's execution is rapidly approaching, James enlisted the help of a young woman to entice Russell to accompany her to New York City. So he's getting him um, out of New Jersey into New York. And when they arrived in New York, this woman immediately deserted them. So it was a little bit of trickery on James's part. But James then told Russell that British troops were offshore, so they would have to take a different route back to New Jersey. So they couldn't go the way they came because, you know, this is, Part, the time when we don't want to encounter the British troops. So with this subterfuge, subterfuge, why can't I speak tonight? The plot is at hand and James was able to get Russell onto a stagecoach bound for Manchester, Vermont. They arrived on December 22nd, 1819, just a month before Stephen's scheduled execution and Russell and James were greeted by a curious crowd who had been alerted about their arrival by a telegraph from James. The crowd included several of Russell's former neighbors and they established that, yeah, this is him. So now the rumors of his murder, um, that, that puts everything in question, right? He, he can't be dead, murdered, and be standing here in front of his neighbors. So this man still claimed to not be Russell. 
But the citizens of Manchester were recognizing him. They were his old friends. They were calling him by name. And he was able to identify places and buildings in the town. And he knew the history of the buildings in the town and the places in the town. He was then taken to the jail and Stephen Bourne was brought out to meet him. And Stephen was in chains. And Russell reportedly asked him why he was in chains. And Stephen replied to him, quote, because they say I murdered you. And Russell then replied, quote, you never hurt me. In the end, there was a universal agreement that this man was indeed Russell Colvin. He testified in a court of in inquiry and then went back to New Jersey. Yeah, he just left. The defense attorneys petitioned for a new trial. The petition was granted. The prosecution responded that they would not prosecute. And Stephen and Jesse Bourne were free. They, they left. Now, the Bourne-Colvin case became the subject of sermons, lectures, articles examining um, the religious, legal, and philosophical implications of false accusations. Um, this was an example of what happens with confirmed coerced confessions, the power of gossip, belief in the supernatural, supernatural, and how all of these can affect legal proceedings. This case has also been in, invoked by defense attorneys throughout the centuries to warn of the dangers of convicting a man on circumstantial evidence alone. Now, just in case you thought that it was all tied up with a night, you know, in a nice package with a pretty bow, um, it wasn't. This case has more twists. Stephen left Manchester as soon as he could and moved to Ohio. He built a farm, he raised a family, and seems to have stayed out of trouble. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesse did a lot of traveling and eventually ended up in Ohio as well with a less respectable occupation. Going by the name of Jesse Bowen, he was a counterfeiter associated with a counterfeiting ring in Cleveland that was particularly good at eluding capture. At this point in the history of Vermont, um, counterfeiting was a very common crime. In 1860, Jesse met a man named Hackett who claimed to be a counterfeiter and wanted Jesse to introduce him to the counterfeiting ring that he was currently running around with. Um, Jesse denied involvement at first, but eventually he trusted Hackett and admitted that he was a counterfeiter. So from what I read at this time, counterfeiting rings usually had the people on the edges, the bag men, you know, they, they took the counterfeit goods and dis dispersed them amongst the people they had the people who knew who the bag men were, and then they had the guy in the middle who nobody knew who he was. Okay. Um, anyway, Jesse admitted that he was a counterfeiter, and then he told this guy Hackett that he and his brother had once killed a man and were released from jail when an imposter that they hired to play the dead man convinced the town that he had never died. Bum, bum, bum. The truth was that Hackett was actually a federal marshal and Jesse was arrested and spent four years in prison for counterfeiting. The story of the imposter was published and made its way back to Vermont, but the Manchester re residents were done. Um, they had already been in the news more than they were comfortable with. And the old timers who had seen the resurrected um, Russell were brought out to the court. They swore again that, yes, that was Russell. I have no doubt. And they were not interested in being hoodwinked again. They were already hoodwinked into believing the brothers had killed Russell. They were not about to say, yeah, maybe he wasn't Russell and have and look bad again. And um, most modern commentators and true crime historians believe that it really was Russell who returned from New Jersey and that the original born convictions were in error. However, 
1993, a man named Gerald McFarland wrote a book called The Counterfeit Man, and he makes a believable case that the Bourne family had perpetrated an elaborate hoax. That, in fact, the resurrected Russell was not the, or the original Russell, but, in, but was, indeed, an imposter hired by the family to get Stephen and Jesse out of prison. I have questions, lots of questions, but mainly if this story was so popular that it was being reported about in the New York Evening Post, why can't I find more information on this family? I mean, for real, why can't I find not more information? Not even newspaper artist sketches of what these individuals look like. There's um, sketches from people's books and online um, sources, but not an official description of either of the, the members of this, like not the brothers, not Sally, not Russell, not anybody. I really would like to know what is going on. I did find a photograph of Barney and Elizabeth's home. So this is Sally's parents. It's a photograph of their home. And I did find a photograph of the newspaper article that Stephen's lawyers put out looking for the, the Russell. So thanks for hanging out with me today. I know that we all love stories with a twist. Um, I have a couple other videos here. I think you would like, I've also added a subscribe button, subscribe, you know, all the things, leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think about the story. Give me a thumbs up and have a fabulous day.